acoustics. Welcome to the School of Theater and Music at the University of Illinois at Chicago. There is no such thing as perfect acoustics. And while this is true on a number of different levels, what I really mean is that this idea that there is some sort of singular ideal of acoustics, it's just not true and it's not even helpful. The notion of perfection is simply incompatible with our experience of acoustical qualities of spaces in the same way that there's no perfect song, there's no perfect book, or perfect building design. Instead, it's usually about balancing a number of different variables to be well-suited for a range of different scenarios and to be able to produce a set of experiences that we humans can appreciate. That's not to say that there aren't situations that are precisely engineered for a certain purpose. I mean, just here on YouTube, you can learn all about the theater of Epidaurus and how you can so clearly hear someone standing in the middle of that huge space or you can learn about the strange clap that gets reflected as a chirp on the steps of Chichen Itza. These are certainly very curious phenomena that result from the interplay of geometry and the physics of waves, but even these aren't really about being perfect. Rather, I think it's more useful and even more beautiful to think about buildings as instruments. All buildings have unique acoustical qualities that contribute to your overall experience of the world. These qualities are shaped through the design of buildings and they can be used to create compositions of sounds that the buildings help to shape. There are guidelines for certain types of spaces that help us to understand when ranges are preferred for various scenarios. And getting spaces to be within those guidelines is different for every space and scenario. The guidelines themselves came about through trial and error, and then testing, and over time, they've been determined to work for a certain range of individuals. So shifting our thinking from acoustics being purely an engineering problem to solve and more of an experiential design opportunity to explore, I think is pretty important. Well, I want to start talking about the space that I'm in, which is a musical performance space. In this video, we'll scale out to discuss how acoustics are an important architectural consideration, even when you don't expect it. How the way that sound travels in and through and around a building is an important aspect of its total designed experience. But the space that I am in is a rehearsal space for the School of Music at the University of Illinois at Chicago. It's where bands and orchestras practice before performing on another stage in front of an audience. The building and this space was designed by the architect Harry Weiss and Associates in 1969. And you might know the work of that architect from such buildings as the Triangular Metropolitan Correctional Facility in downtown Chicago. And that's where R. Kelly and Jerry from Netflix's show Cheer is being held. This more exuberant but also windowless space has a few features that make it appropriate for playing music without an audience. Firstly is its shape. The volume of the space is sculpted in such a way so that the players can hear the conductor and that the conductor can hear the players and players can hear each other. Typically orchestras are arranged so that the quieter and higher pitched instruments are toward the front and then the louder and lower toned instruments are toward the back. Higher pitched sounds are more directional while lower ones aren't as much. When you're toward the front of the space, the cone shape of both the plan and the section project the sound into the rest of the room so that soloists or violins or flutes can be heard. But instruments like the timpani drums or double basses or tubas, they're in the back and fill the space with low-end bassy sounds. The angles of the walls and the ceiling reflect the sound down and directly to the other performers. These reflections are called first order reflections because they are the first bounce that reaches their target. It's important in this application that those bounces happen quickly, otherwise it will create an echo or distort the sound in other ways getting to the players. The front wall is also built with a slight tilt upward to help those first order reflections reach their target. Another consideration of these spaces is the design of this side wall, which has a checkerboard pattern of blocks with soft material indented in between. This helps both to diffuse the sound and absorb it as the sound waves get trapped inside of these recessed spaces. So here it's less about targeting specific reflections Rather, it's about scattering the sound evenly and then absorbing a large chunk of it. This helps to control the reverberation time, which is the amount of time that it takes for a sound to dissipate within a space. This time is an important part of the performance for a space like this. If the reverb time is too short, it will sound dead. And if it's too long, all of the sounds will get muddled together. The architecturally trained musician and talking head 
David Byrne, he has a great talk about how music has always been written and composed specifically for the space within which it will be played. Hymnal music is made to be heard inside of a cathedral, which has long echoes and resonant frequencies. Byrne's own music evolved by playing at small clubs and loud venues, and stadium rock is loud for a reason. Today, most of us listen to music with headphones inside of distracting environments, and only certain kinds of music can cut through all of that. One of the first architectural examples of a building shaping a particular kind of music is St. Mark's Basilica, which is attached to the Doge's palace. This basilica isn't built in the traditional shape of a Latin cross, rather it takes the form of a Greek cross with four equal arms. Each arm of the cross has an upper gallery of choir loss. And during the 16th century, Giovanni Gabrielli, he developed a technique of using multiple dispersed choirs and musical ensembles in each of the separate lofts that would perform simultaneously and create an immersive wave of sounds coming from all directions. Cathedrals are also like instruments when they're fitted with organs, which fold the entire building into a building the sound. The Bach Church in Arnstadt is named after the composer Bach, who famously wrote specific organ compositions here. The space allowed him to write music that is slightly more intricate than he would be writing in, say, a Gothic cathedral, because he could change keys without creating any dissonances that would be occurring in the space due to reflections of sounds and odd ways. But sound shapes architecture in all sorts of ways, even when they're not making beautiful music together. Here in Chicago, a popular activity is to stand under the Cloudgate Monument and make noise to hear it reflected back in a particular way. The shiny reflective surface of the bean, coupled with the curved enveloping shape, creates a really unique sound signature. In fact, the city is marked by all sorts of sounds that maybe go in one ear and out the other, but subconsciously is shaping your understanding of the city as much as what the city looks like. While this might not seem like the domain of architecture, it is mostly buildings that figure into how one part of the city sounds different from another. It's pretty easy to understand how acoustics plays a role in performance spaces. Even though the physics is complicated, it's obvious to recognize that acoustics are important. But in everyday contexts, it's not quite as noticeable, even though it is an important component that shapes your understanding of the space around you. This is called a place's soundscape. You can even think of it like a landscape for sound. The way that an environment shapes sound is mostly related to geometry and materiality. Sound interacts with buildings in three primary ways, transmission, absorption, and reflection. All of these are functions of the material mass, the surface smoothness, texture, porosity and airtightness, and then stiffness. Transmission is the passage of sound through and between materials, including the air and the walls. Attenuation measures its loss as it's traveled through the material. Acoustic absorption refers to the process by which a material, structure, or an object takes in sound energy when sound waves are encountered, as opposed to reflecting the energy. Part of the absorbed energy is transformed into heat, and part is transmitted through the absorbing body. An acoustic traveling wave can be reflected by a solid surface as well. While reflections kind of act like a mirror for sound, there is a curious thing that happens with sound waves as opposed to light. With reflections, you get two waves in the same space. If the waves align, you get a type of sound amplification. And then if the waves misalign, they almost cancel each other out. And this phenomena can lead to strange or desirable phenomena depending on the situation. So these are the three main principles that are guiding the sound qualities all around you. And some architects use these to create unique conditions and experiences very specifically. For example, here at the McCormick Student Center at IIT, the architect Rem Kolhas placed the building right underneath the train tracks. And the building is organized around an intensity of activity by packing in all sorts of different programs and circulation paths that slice right through the middle part of the building. The train above is part of this flurry of activity. The train is wrapped in a metal sleeve, and this helps capture the sound and muffle it. The tube presses down into the building below, intentionally carrying the sounds of the train into the rest of the building. And 
this is a moment where quiet isn't necessarily the goal. Rather, the building operates like an instrument, capturing the sounds of the city and altering them and carrying them through the architecture so that inside the building, you feel connected to the city around you. This idea that architecture is an instrument is also taken quite literally at moments when sound isn't even a primary concern. One of the most innovative architectural educational programs comes from Cooper Union, where its then director, John Haydick, he conceived of a unique curriculum to train architects in the design and drawing of buildings. And he believed that the drawing itself was architecture and could be discussed as an act of architecture. One of the more successful exercises that they underwent encouraged students to make technical drawings of musical instruments. Haydick called these drawings pregnant with architecture. And one of Haydick's students, and also my professor, Jesse Reiser, he internalized these lessons to become directly part of his firm's thinking when designing projects like the Kaohsiung Port Terminal, where they wanted the building to perform as an instrument, but not necessarily look like one. The building performs like intersecting funnel, the channels people and air through a taut, stretched skin of structural shells that the architect likens to the logic of an oboe. The way that sight and views work in the building are also guided by this logic with channels that crisscross one another, similar to the way that air is choreographed within an instrument to create different experiences by closing certain paths and then by opening others. There are so many ways that architecture connects with sound, music, and acoustics. I mean, Nietzsche called architecture frozen music. And there are a host of famous musicians who also trained as architects before getting into music. And there are composer-architect collaborations that create important and unique buildings and music as well. But either way, this idea that acoustics can be perfect, I think is distracting from the fact that buildings are in fact instruments for sound. What are some of your favorite acoustical spaces? Drop a comment below and let us know. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and maybe subscribe to the channel. If you do, we'll fill your feed with various takes on architectural topics like these to the right of me. See you over there.